talk about what I have mostly used my life to focus on, which is endoposophic medicine, mistletoe, and its use in oncology. Um, but I thought maybe you would have a thought or a question before we start, and maybe hopefully a little bit thought-provoking. Um, over the last many, maybe century, you could say, we've had a lot of questioning and consciousness of the humanity and where many things have happened uh, and from um, women's rights to civil rights we have people with disabilities and their rights etc and of course those are very very important uh, things that are happening in our day-to-day -to -day world and I wanted to bring it up because we, we sort of think in our modern times that, yeah, I'm the most open-minded person in the world. Um, but really, if we examine our prejudices and our thinking, we find the prejudice there that, hey, looking backwards in time, we're way better than those ancient Egyptians where the pharaoh was this head poncho taking advantage of everybody, uh, which is today the materialistic assumption. And, and so I would call that something like ethicism. Um, and of course, materialism is there's not a possibility for anything but matter forces to work in the human being. Um, I think many of my patients have proved that to be to the contrary. Thank you very much. And just by living, I think, we, living and breathing, we prove that to the contrary. Um, of course, the great alchemists um, are today, many modern scientific circles looked at as a, like, who were these people? They were trying to make gold um, out of that. Maybe they were in an inward quest. Um, that would be another way to look at it with a different viewpoint. So what is this thing that we do in the clinic um, that we call this big fancy word, anthroposophic medicine, uh, which we've coined as humanizing medicine because it's a lot easier to say and it gets to the meaning of it. Um, anthropos means human being and Sophia is wisdom. And so there's this wisdom of the true nature of the human being. And we're really trying to bring to the practice of health and healing the same knowledge and insights that so right now we're in the Waldorf School uh, and that is operated on, it doesn't teach anthroposophy or these things, but it's, it's actually one of the, the fruits of it, where we, see, we can say children grow and they're in, in this uh, holistic way, and we can look at that and say, oh, maybe we want to treat this grade that's a lower grade in one way and this uh, higher grade in a different way not all this sausage stump stuffing type activity that's done usually. Um, and of course, biodynamic agriculture was inspired by anthroposophy as well. Um, so with us, we have typically conventionally trained um, physicians and nurses who have undergone more training because um, we need to expand our reach. We need to understand how to think about the human being and medicine in a new way. Um, so, what is anthroposophic medicine? So, wow, this is in Europe. It's not just a little clinic like mine. It's an inpatient public hospital, a um, big place. And it was funded, founded by Rudolf Steiner um, in cooperation with, uh, back then, a rare, but very powerful female physician um, back in the 18, 1900s. Basically, we view illness not just as a random thing, but as something that's really integral to biography. And especially uh, severe illness is something that makes you look at what your past was, what your future was, what your present is, and those things get pulled apart for a while. And you have to put them together in a new way. Um, you can only imagine. It's good to really look at biographical things like that, um, to, to read 
find our meaning. As, as, as human beings, we are beings of meaning. Um, another big hospital, uh, so these, there are several facilities like this that are in, integrative medical facilities all throughout Europe, um, part of the public system. So in Switzerland, they take patients with, um, you know, they accept basically all of the national health system covers all the care in there. In Germany, it depends on your health insurance, um, et cetera. But they, they exist in the modern system. The, we sort of have a foot in both worlds, which I think is useful. Um, one important principle is the principle of the threefold human being. So with the threefold human being, we, we actually, surprisingly, at first, because you're like, oh, plants I'm encountering day to day, flowers up here, the roots down there, but we really are looking at the human being as analogous or really as a, a being that is an upside down plant, you could say. Um, and that's a funny way of, of saying that the plant's nerve sense system is up in the roots, down in the roots, this one's upside down. And the metabolic, the warmth, reproductive elements are in flowers and the roots are really in between. Um, that can help when we're finding a remedy or emphasizing um, foods, for instance. Um, you can look at this uh, at many levels. So this is another pretty little watercolor slide. Um, so human being, we have the cool nerve center pole where thinking is happening. The metabolic system down here and the rhythmic system in the middle, upside down plant. And you say, well, where does this three-folding also happen? And you can see it in the skin. This is the epidermis here. This is the, um, the middle layer. And this is the subdermis um, here. And different processes work different ways in the skin. But for example, it will go into a bit of the three-fold nature. But um, psoriasis is not too uncommon. People have probably seen these sort of psoriatic plaques that occur. Um, and it's a good example of, well, what's happening with this warmth pole? I mean, the, this metabolic pole, you have lots and lots of life and lots of reproduction. And you have youth forces. Um, the intestines and digestive organs and the limbs are part of the metabolic limb system. And the, it's important to note the cells in the pollen, when you, if you could see them, they're only a few days old. Um, they don't get older than that. After that, they, they die and you get new ones that re reborn themselves out of the crypts. Um, and of course, up in the head region, you don't have lots of forces of life. Um, but with psoriasis, you have uncontrolled growth. You actually have too much reproduction of the skin elements. Um, and you don't have a good epidermal barrier, so it opens up. Um, so you have this, these metabolic forces going upward. Um, and in eczema, which is, you could say, almost the opposite thing that's happening, um, you have a nerve sense impetus, so something stimulating more an antigen stimulating our nerve sense system, and then it's triggering a reaction um, that's much more conscious. Uh, and so there's the beautiful ways that we can look at this threefold element. Um, one is the, the cell. So you can actually see a, um, a information system. As everybody knows, the DNA is in the nucleus. Um, you can see down here the metabolic system. You can see the lysosomes and the things that are moving, um, the, the parts that are digesting. Um, and then you can see in the middle the, the breathing apparatus, this mitochondria, which we really like mitochondria, and the Golgi complex, um, really the heart 
of the, of the cell. Um, it's pretty easy to see the threefold brain. We, we all know about it. You know, the, when we're in lizard mode, we're only sort of fight or flight. So yeah, the reptilian brain is fight or flight. You just react. You have good reflexes, but it's much more in the, in the brain stem, in the metabolic. The mammalian brain is feeling feelings. That's where feelings happen. And the, the, the neocortex, that's really where we're cool and collected and we can reason and have logic. So you, you also see this threefold here in the, this nature of how we're built. Um, it's really everywhere. You can look at it in government structures. Um, the, and and uh, I, I think it's actually quite beautiful. Um, to go into more detail, the nerve sy sense system relates to crystals um, and to salt. And it, the nerve tissue doesn't regenerate. And real growth really doesn't exist in the nerve sense system. You have to, actually, you have a lot of me metabolic work happening in the brain just to keep it alive. Um, because your brain is always on the verge of depolarization, and depolarization is consciousness. So that's what we're sacrificing. We're sacrificing life up here in order to have consciousness, con human conscious experience. Um, and if this head forces go too deep into the body, if they're working in a way they shouldn't, you end up with sclerosis. Um, and hardening um, prematurely. So that, that's a, a typical illness of our time. Metabolic limb system is inflammation and life, etc. So movement happens here, the action of muscles. Um, you'll see the lots of movement if you could see the intestines, if you put an ultrasound on the belly, the first thing you see is lots and lots of movement of the intestines. Um, they're always moving. They always should be moving. If they're not, you have some problems um, with, with your digestion. Um, and you end up with a transformation of substances. And of course, the rhythmic system is in between, and it's, it's actually moderating the, the two poles. Um, so the heart and the lung are, are moderating, they're balancing out the forces of the blood that's gone up to the head, and it has to meet the blood that's been around the block in the, in the hand and the arm, um, and that meets. And there's actually one point in time in the heart that's actually really sacred, where all the valves close. It's the, the blood is almost held like a, a, a being in, in that one millisecond before the heart then lets that blood pulsate through the body. Uh, we don't view the heart as a pump, per se. We view it as the, the principal work of the heart as a rhythm restorer in the body. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about was homeopathics and what what is homeopathic? Of course, people may know it quite well or not know it at all, but homeopathy means that a, a, we're trying to take the forces of a substance. So if you look at sulfur, sulfur, if you light sulfur on fire and you wave it in front of a group of people, as they smell it, they will respond with great, great um, movement. And because it really, it, it ha is something really integral in the human being. It's like, wow, um, it's gripping. It's something, sulfur relates to this nerve sense pole. Um, and it's, of course, what allows, there's two sulfur amino acids, and it allows us to actually be alive as human beings. Our, our proteins are able to link and, and cross-link in very, very complicated ways. So this sulfur is a, a force of, uh, in us that allows a lot to happen and a lot of healing to happen, and it tends to get things unstuck. So for instance, the compounds in onion or garlic 
when you put them on the ear, which we encourage parents with uh, children to put this onion compress on the ear, uh, when there's otitis media, which is an ear infection, and that will open up the eustachian tube, relieve the pain, and most of the time naturally relieve an ear infection with no antibiotics. Those are sulfur compounds, so they're unsticking a stuck process. But how do you take the, the forces, or can you take the forces, from the sulfur and work them in the human being on a different level? And that's this question that we live with, and I, I would say the answer is yes. We've given uh, homeopathic peat moss. Um, homeopathic peat moss can have outstanding, outstanding um, pain, uh, pain relieving properties that I've, for one, I've never seen anything else work as fast as it or as powerfully as it in certain circumstances. It doesn't work on every single person, but when it works, it's absolutely outstanding. So, of course, the materialist and in our daily life, we are all brought up with this, this uh, training, this education that the world is all just atoms. Then how do we understand this? Well, so I like to look at what are the concentrations of substances in our body in daily life. So if you don't know, D1 means it's a 10% um, solution. Um, and D12 means it's basically a millionth of a million. Um, and, and then so on, of course. And we're not just diluting with homeopathy. There's a special vortex process that mixes and opens up the substance, um, the carrier substance to the, to the mother substance, um, which is, goes beyond what I can say right now. It's more of a pharmacologic um, lecture then. But these are the concentrations of certain things, uh, certain homeopathics that we use. Um, and in our body, we use sodium. It's about a D1 per, per uh, concentration. Um, blood glucose, if it goes to D4 or D2, then we're, we're sort of in trouble. Um, we're either very hypoglycemic or very diabetic. Um, potassium, we don't, won't even talk about what happens if it goes even a little bit. Um, not, definitely not an or order of magnitude of 10, um, because that would be upsetting to your heart. Uh, insulin is more in the D9, and we see D10. E11 even, at thyroid hormone. So very, very minute amount of substance is actually making a big impact. We know what happens if you don't have enough thyroid hormone. Yeah. And, um, if, and if you have um, not enough antidiuretic hormone, uh, drinking your coffee or your beer, uh, you will need to void. You will have a lot in your bladder. Um, but it really only takes a millionth of a millionth of that uh, to have that effect. It's amazing. Um, this is a rather abstract number. I, I had a newsletter once that I named D23 as a celebration of D23. So what does that mean? <laughs> it means I'm a nerd, basically. But D23 is... Uh, Avogadro's number is something like 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. I might get the 0.02. My, my uh, chemistry teacher might find me. Um, I don't have it memorized. But, um, oh no, it'll do. It's right here. 6.02 times 10 to the, all right. Yay, there, I learned something in chemistry. The, um, if you look, what is the base weight of one BRCA1 mutation? in one cell. So what if it happens in one cell? Well, a ton, 650 Daltons. That's a really, really lightweight mutation in the human body. Um, D23 is Avogadro's number. And what the significance of that is, is if you have a potentization above D23, you're more than likely than not to have no, none of the original substance in there. Um, so materialists will say, once you go to D23, you're going into this imponderable, what they would say, nonsense zone. 
in homeopathics. Um, because there isn't any physical matter there at all. The, the chances of finding physical matter are actually lower than, than not. Um, and what I'm saying here with this crazy calculation is that if you have one mutation that ca then causes cancer, BRCA1 causes cancer, that that concentration by weight is 6.5 times 10 to the 25th, uh, negative 25th, which means that that's 100 times more unlikely to find that. It's, it's in the imponderable range, which makes sense. The meaning of why did I have cancer is not, a, I think, goes way beyond the physical, goes into the imponderable. Um, but this is, this is uh, commonly used as a critique of homeopathics, this D23. Um, so now that we've gone through some of those things, um, we can go to mistletoe, which is called viscum album. That's European mistletoe. It's a white berry mistletoe. Uh, with really more uniform leaves. The American mistletoe is a different genus, but it's pretty similar looking. Uh, we're doing some studies on it now uh, at Uriel. But over the last hundred plus years, Viscum album has been the only one really used medicinally. Um, and if you look in the box and say, what is in the box of cancer treatment if somebody unfortunately gets diagnosed with cancer, um, with this really life-changing illness, um, whether it's early stage or late, it's life-changing. Um, you, you don't have a lot of great things in there. Um, you have chemothera chemotherapy, surgery, radiation, and now we have immunotherapy. And unfortunately, looking at uh, I don't like to look at statistics because <coughs> none of my patients are a statistic, period. Um, they are people. But if you look at statistically, years out, we, we don't have a 100% survival curve with any cancer, even in early stage. Stage two breast cancer means you either just have a, a, a less than four lymph nodes in the axilla uh, and no tumor or a very small tumor or no lymph nodes in, a, in a, just a tumor in the breast. Um, and if you do everything, so this is the PREDICT tool, which is used quite a lot, it's free to look at, um, you can see that, well, the surgery alone has a pretty good survival benefit at first, but if you look at recurrence risk, it's more. If you do hormone therapy, that adds some. Um, chemotherapy, you're only adding a little icing on the cake, actually, but you are adding something. Um, and then if it's, a, this is for a HER2 her positive, so you can add Herceptin in um, and add more. But of course, our heart should sink. We should say that's not enough. We should do, we should have more options. And indeed we do, but we have not, PREDICT has not updated mistletoe yet. So I did it myself. Uh, and we put that in here too, <laughs> and I didn't add IV vitamin C and curcumin and all the rest, but that's what, to me, integrative oncology partly is, when you really are just looking at the raw data, um, because people don't have enough options. And what is anthroposophic integrative oncology? Well, for one, we want to improve the patient's health, and immune function through them being actively participating in their care. That's actually really important. How much in medicine do you, you know, maybe you slide your arm through a blood pressure cuff, but you don't do much more. Um, we're, you know, we, we're not doing much, but the nice thing is, is with Eurythmy, you're, we're moving. With art therapy, which is this, partly, um, we're making something and we're, with biography work, we're getting to know the deeper meaning of our lives and our illness. Um, we want to improve inner well-being. We, of course, want to work on functional parameters. And we use botanicals. I use off-labels. And of course, we want to individualize care and working in the holistic framework of anthroposophy um, that gives us 
to the, uh, this view of the human being, um, which I think is quite special. So we can take a step backwards and say, what is cancer? Um, it's a big question. One thing that you might have seen or heard of is cancer in cancer care is GRADE. So there's STAGE. STAGE talks about typically where is the cancer? Is it stage zero where it's basically a, a pre-cancer that hasn't gone anywhere? Stage one, which is still really local. Stage two, a little less local. Stage three, and stage four. That's different than GRADE. GRADE is a you can only see in, the, in a microscope. And the pathologist, who's the doctor, is looking for uh, three different grades. So there's scoring criteria, basically, but a grade one is a really good thing. Grade one is not so common in cancer. It does happen. But grade one means that the tissue looks just practically like, with a few exceptions, it looks a lot like the original organ or the original tissue. If someone had liver cancer and they have grade one liver cancer, the pathologist could show it to anyone else that knows what a liver looks like under the microscope and say, this looks like a liver. Um, or this looks like a breast and this looks like skin. Um, grade one retains its organizational structure um, because our whole body is a body that is rooted in organization and, and that's because of our eye forces that penetrate that. The soul forces that then coordinate our life being and then of course make this physical stuff that's here. Um, and grade three, which is the the worst grade or the more chaotic grade, you you could take that slide and if it weren't stained, because the stains help to say, oh, that's that's this type of tissue. Um, no, it's so chaotic. There's cells growing all over the place, uh, mitotic figures, etc., uh, which means the function, the organizational structure of the original tissue. So no one would know this, this is liver, could be from anywhere. Um, and you can guess which one is more aggressive or, and which one is less aggressive. So grade three, which is totally chaotic, tends to be more aggressive because it's foreign to the human being. It has stepped away from the human organism and said, I'm in full rebellion. And grade one says, I'm still doing something here. We're giving you the finger a little bit, or we're <laughs> doing this, but I'm still, maybe I'm even making some thyroid hormone, but I'm, um, I'm a functional, reproductive tumor, but I, I'm not a good um, part of your organism because I'm not really following all the rules. But you can tell what I am because I'm still dwarfing. Um, and that, that actually, I think, is a deeply spiritual thing that we look in the microscope and you can see right there. It's how far out from the organism has this cancer jumped. Um, how much in rebellion is it? Um, and of course, this is my fun picture of mistletoe um, and a whole symphony below it. But before we go into it, this these, these forces of um, doing different things, you could ask, you could pose the question, where should these forces be? Um, and that might sound like a crazy question. So where should these forces be? Um, we, we certainly don't want those forces to be in this tissue here. We don't want these forces which are going beyond the rules, which are breaking rules, which are in a way semi-autonomous, which are um, in a way creative in their own way. We, we don't want those operating in the physical piece of our body. <coughs> um, where we could see those forces being very useful is in our 
body that's in the consciousness sphere. So if you look at um, creativity and you look at the, the things that we can do with our soul, it, 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 it really doesn't have a limit to that it is limited by the physical body, which is something that's so inspirational about art. Um, and I think that is, it's not the only touchstone, that's one touchstone where it makes a lot of sense why we're not just giving mistletoe. We are emphasizing compresses, eurythmy, and artistic therapy with patients because these actually can make a soul difference and can activate forces where if they're dormant and they're left to, to do things in the body, then they can cause trouble. Um, just like the old adage that maybe that idle hands can cause, um, or what is it, busy hands cause? <laughs> Idle hands are the devil's workshop. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> um, but basically, that it, you can transform these forces and put them on a higher level. <coughs> and one example um, is it, if we take a specific cancer of how does cancer relate to the emotional and soul life. Um, you can see this a bit more clearly in ovarian cancer. Um, and this is, we don't want to just take a, a bunch of sort of hearsay and say, oh, well, ovarian is, th these people are like this. We want to start with the, the actual facts. We want to start with the science. Like, what do the ovaries do? Well, number one, which, what, what part of the ovary tends to get the cancer? It's, it's not the part that's making babies, typically. Um, not the part that's making eggs. It's the part that's, that's actually called the, uh, the ovarian epithelium. So epithelium is sort of like a skin of cells that grows over the ovaries. And if you look as a question, what causes that epithelium to activate, to reproduce? You could say, well, um, the what what's its function? Well, about once a month after puberty, women have um, ovulation, and ovulation is a uh, you could look at it from a certain point of view as a traumatic event. the The ovary is going to have a the epithelium will burst through. Uh, and there'll be an, a vulnerable open place and that'll allow the egg to go potentially get fertilized and make another human being but you have this open area and the epithelium has to grow to, to cover that and whenever you you have a trauma there then the, the ovarian epithelium is saying Ah, I'll cover you back up. It's okay. Um, it's 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 okay. So where else do we see this? We see it in Johnson and Johnson literature, right? We we have litigation against them. Anyone has heard? Talcum. Yeah, uh, talcum powder. Talcum powder. Yeah. So, what do you mean? Well, the talcum powder can make its way. It's, in, in, in anatomy, we've learned that actually, well, of course, um, the, the talcum powder can make its way all the way to irritate that um, ovary epithelium, and then it is proliferative again, sort of an external traumatic event. So there is a plausibility there. The, if you go to other animals, so does anyone know an animal that ovulates a whole lot? Uh, somebody say chicken. Yes. <laughs> Chickens ovulate daily, almost daily, something like 300 times a year. Um, and rabbits too. So, but a chicken has uh, once, it, its lifespan is quite short. The ones that have been bred to have an egg every day 
practically will die of ovarian cancer if they're not put in a, who knows what the, we are doing to them in factory farms. But the ones that have been bred to ovulate a lot will have ovarian cancer because this epithelium is saying, oh, I need to soothe mm -hmm. over this traumatized ovary. There's another thing that's interesting, um, and it doesn't make any sense on the face of it. But it, and I'm not advocating for this, but if a woman gets her tubes tied, it lowers the risk of ovarian cancer. Wow, <laughs> holy mackerel, what, is, what are we talking about? Because that doesn't make any sense, right? Except it does now, because you're actually sealing off the outer world when you have your tubes tied from, uh, you're sealing off the ovaries from the outer world, so there's not allowable anything to traumatize them, um, anything in. So there actually is pretty strong evidence that tying tubes will prevent ovarian cancer. It has a protective effect, which shouldn't make any sense. And so we can see that this the function of that epithelium is to say, it's okay, it's, it's okay to trauma. And if there's trauma, if there's a violation and, there's, uh, and that's taken into the soul in a certain way, it's not too hard of a jump to say, this tissue is promoted to grow. And it's trying to, and it gives you a whole different view potentially of the cancer that it's there actually as a response to emotional trauma, potentially. Not always, obviously, it's ne never 100%. Um, but there's a soul element. If you look at breast cancer or any type of most cancers, you see the word adeno before the carcinoma. And adeno just means it's a gland. And glands are very special because they relate to the soul organism. And anyone who has ever breastfed or been around anyone who's breastfed, um, and I have six children, so I have some experience being around, but we know that soul states will impact how much milk is produced, when it's let down, etc., etc. So soul states have a dramatic effect on this adeno tissue. Um, whether it's an adenocarcinoma of the colon, or of the breast, or really anywhere else, there's a soul element that connects there. And that's essential. Now, we want to be as, as clear and scientific about it as possible, but I think that's very important to say before we talk about mistletoe. And mistletoe is a very special plant in that it is also a rebellious plant in a way it's breaking all of these rules in nature. Um, it doesn't grow, you know, if you look at it, this isn't a good example, but it's growing in a ball in the tree. It's not growing straight up. It's nature's little class clown saying, you want me to grow up? Okay, well, I'll grow in a whole ball and part of me's growing up and I'm over here growing every which direction possible and growing really slowly. I'm not even gonna metamorphosize my leaves. They'll just stay almost like pumpkin leaves, the first ones, cotyledons. And the berries I make will take nine months to go from one winter to the next winter. Um, so the growth habit is, uh, of course, very weird. And of course, we didn't even mention it only is in the tree. It's not growing on the ground. So a lot of weird things happening with it that are all sort of breaking the rules in nature. And you're saying, wow, well, this plant is dealing with that, though. It's thriving. Um, and, of course, cancer also is breaking the body's rules, the rules that the body lives by. And this healing plant can teach us something on some level or another. And when it's injected into the lymphatic tissue, it stimulates a red area in the skin, and that red area has been biopsied, and it's actually now clear from studies that are many years old that it, that it has a direct upregulation of your Th1 system, which is T cells 
natural killer cells. Those are the security guards. Those are a physical manifestation of our, what we in anthroposophic medicine call our eye forces. So your system that says, is this me or is this not me? Is not, it's either not seeing right or it's not working. There's a, a cancer there that's been developed because of course the cancer is not really the person. Um, it's, a, it's in rebellion, but it, it can't always be found and detected properly. And mistletoe can push that in the right direction. And there's many, there's four types of mistletoe. There's Iskisen and Iskador, and this one's Abnova, and that one's Helixor. They're made in different sterile manufacturing plants, in, one in Switzerland, three in Germany. Um, and depending on how the host tree, and depending on how it's harvested, and the dose, of course, we can do things and work as a doctor, just like this conductor here, and say, I want to use the cannon over here in Tchaikovsky's 1812 Overture. All right, there's not a cannon, but you know what I mean. And, and the little piccolo and all of the, it, it makes sense. You can use it in some mistletoe here and a different one over here in a different situation. So some is very, very aggressive and powerful. Um, and I, I had some, a friend actually a couple of days ago say, oh, well, I'm, I, I, I have lupus, so I can never use mistletoe. And I said, actually, that's not true. Mistletoe can be very useful for lupus um, and can still be used. You just have to be careful. You need to know what you're doing with it and know which tree to select, which host tree makes a big difference. Um, so those manufacturers package it sterilely, so it's sterilely filtrated and is packaged in ampules. And that can be injected or infused, etc. We'll get to some of that. Um, in, in the US, we have the most access to Helixor and Abnova. Um, those are two brands. Iskador is a fermented mistletoe that then gets filtrated. Um, so it has endotoxins that are further stimulating the immune system. Um, and Iskisen is, a, a, it, ha, it actually is made in homeopathic dilutions all the way up to a very strong uh, grade that's called H. That's a, a strength that is very potent. Uh, it rivals Abnova Fraxini, one of the strongest mistletoes. Um, as you can see in this chart. So take careful notes. No, just joking. Uh, <laughs> this is complex, but it's nice to know that it exists, that we have this research. And it's really looking at the lectins in the mistletoe. And of course, there's more than just lectins. Um, and so if you look at, at, for instance, Abnova piney, if you took a whole bag of that and infused it, which we typically may do that, but usually we're injecting a very small portion of it, you're only getting 3,000 nanograms of lectins in that, that bag of fluid. If you do Fraxini, you're getting 280,000 nanograms um, of lectins, which is quite a bit more, um, which is interesting. It, mistletoe, I should say, is not about the components you still get a gesture of the host tree. You're getting something of the host tree and the properties of that working constitutionally in the person, hopefully in the right way. You can match it to the needs of the person. But this is also a useful chart to know that it exists. And you can see Iskador has a very low level of lectins, but those endotoxins do something else special. Um, and the preparation itself is very specially made. Um, so if you are what you eat, what is in mistletoe? It's a good question. Um, even if you're a dinosaur, I guess. Uh, it, the lectins, they stimulate your T-cells, natural killer, and they also have a secondary role that's been clearly found in the literature. They inhibit ribosomal subunit in the cancer cells, and they cause the cancer cell to die. Wow. What does mistletoe do in the body? Well, very clearly, 
doesn't matter which mistletoe you give, if you measure core body temperature, it warms the body up. And warmth is a signature of these eye forces working in the body. So it's, it's really working in a warming way. Um, the viscotoxins, they, cause, they also cause a different type of cancer cell death. Um, so they work together. Um, and Rudolf Steiner, over 100 years ago, was a clairvoyant, working with other scientists who were not, but respected him a lot, uh, enough to, to trust him. And he said things that weren't even proven for decades and decades longer. It's quite fascinating. And this is one that just tickles me, where he said, oh, well, to make it properly, you'd need to mix the, the extract of the summer leaves of the mistletoe with the extract of the more of the stalk and the root in the winter um, of the mistletoe. So you're taking two extracts and you mix them. And he gave some very special directions of how to mix them even with a vortex and one dripping into the other. And every manufacturer pays attention to that. And of course you could say, well, it was just faith and we took him on faith and just believed him. Or you could take a little closer look and say, oh, wait, the viscotoxins are highest in the outside of the leaves, and they're highest in the summer. They're more of a dissolving. So in, in alchemy, you have the salt principle, you have the sulfur principle. The salt principle is crystallizing and clear. It's directing. Uh, it's giving information. It's giving solidity. And the dissolving principle is making things new again. It's cleaning. And the viscotoxins have the sulfur principle. It's dissolving cancer cells. It causes these cancer cells to necrose, to actually dissolve. It, if you look at what it does under a microscope, they link up and they make a hole in the membrane of the cancer cell. Um, and then that cell's in big trouble. And whereas the mistletoe lectins are highest in the winter time, and, and they're highest in the root. Well, mistletoe has a uh, haustorium. I guess we could call that a root, uh, the, this root principle. So you can see this threefold part clearly. Um, this is a busy slide, but it talks about all the other things that are in mistletoe in different ways. So glycoproteins, that's our um, lectins, and polypeptides are viscotoxins, and then you have some polysaccharides, flavonoids, tritrophines, um, and glycosides, and they all have different, uh, have been found to have different effects in the human being, especially ones that have cancer. This is a, just a chart of the different host trees. You have ash, which has the highest lectins, and also the highest viscotoxins, and it, it doesn't always follow the, the lectins, viscotoxins together, but pine barely has any. So that's just one little glimpse. And the other way to have a glimpse is to really go out in nature and, and experience these trees. Um, how do you use mistletoe? So in the basics, what most people do, and 75% of people who have cancer use mistletoe in Europe. Um, it's quite a lot. It's sort of in the culture. It's, uh, it, I don't know much else like this where standard of care is different in one country than another, um, so much as using this botanical gift from nature. Um, we want about a quarter size skin reaction, and we adjust the dose based on skin reactions. Um, you can use mistletoe IV. Uh, we can give it in very high doses initially to cause a fever on purpose. Uh, we can inject it directly into tumors. We can place it into the peritoneum. That's like around the intestines for peritoneal implants and such. In the, in the pleura, which is around the lungs, um, the Koreans have done a lot of work there, and I think actually that may be where FDA approval comes from, is the Koreans work on reversing uh, and holding back malignant pleural effusions. 
It's, it's safer than bleomycin, it's safer than doxycycline, it's safer than talc, which is the, the three other alternatives, and it works better too. And it's mistletoe, which has other anti-cancer effects. Um, and there's some phase two, three studies happening in Europe with bladder cancer, so where it's instilled in the bladder with a catheter, you hold it there, um, and, and then release. Um, and in one hospital, at least uh, in Berlin, they're using mistletoe in uh, pericardial effusions that are malignant, so the cancer is invaded around the heart sac, and they've had success putting mistletoe there. I don't have enough success to put a needle there, but wow. Um, this is what it looks like, and if you really like belly buttons, get into mistletoe. You will get so many on your phone. Um, but, and at first, the funny thing was, people wouldn't label their text, and they expected me to know who they were from their belly button. And I do know who they were. So this is Lori, <laughs> and that's, no, I do know some people. Um, and that's Julie, actually. Uh, but the, there's some interesting reactions. So that's too big of a reaction, of a normal reaction. That's big. Um, that's about a quarter, half dollar size. Can't really see that one so well, but it's it's uh, sort of right in there. And that's a good size one. This one's, that's an old one, and that one's a little bit faded, but the right size. Um, and so it's, it, it's very patient dependent. And if we go by way back to the integrative slide, we want patients to take a role. So we, unless they're very, very needle phobic, they're able to do this at home. We're, we're not making them come in and do it. Um, and I think that that's actually a sacred time for a patient to take their own health in hand. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about the trees, not all the trees. We really don't have time to talk about all the trees, even though I love all the host trees. So the fir tree is a really beautiful example of how we look at this signature of a tree. We want to look as almost a scientific artist. We can look at a fir forest and say, what's it like in there? Well, it's dark. Uh, even if, if the sun's beating down, it's pretty dark it's and silent. protected. Um, and the weather might be like this out there, but you probably be protected in there. Um, and it's very organized. You have this conifer, um, very almost crystalline type tree, um, these conifers are. So there's a lot more nerve sense and there's a lot more structure. Um, so there's a real structuring that happens too. And the fur we use when there's, we, we don't want lots of inflammation, we want structure. Um, and we, we have a sensitive patient or one that's been through a lot or is going through a lot. So if it's a real, really robust chemotherapy regimen they're on that is getting to them, the fur can really help lift them up and keep them going. And I, I found that over and over again. Um, the fur actually has the higher amount of polyols and polyols are compounds in mistletoe that relate to the fact that they're a parasite in a tree that have a problem because in the winter, the, there's no sap flowing. They want that sap. So they excrete this polyol into the branch, and the mistletoe host tree will say, oh, OK, we'll flow some sap up this way, just for you. <laughs> um, well, that polyol compound in the human being boosts endorphins. It helps with pain. It helps with energy. It's very fascinating, the effect on the life organism. Um, the apple tree is one of the most giving trees that we have, uh, of, of the host trees. We have uh, just a plethora of metabolic fruit, juicy, sweet, and abundant apples, of course. Back in the old days, we would have never had farmsteads if we didn't have apples. Um, and we, we think of them in metabolic type patients or tumors of the abdomen and really especially of the reproductive system. Um, the pine tree is more of a masculine tree, 
more, uh, it's also a conifer, but you see a lot more life. Um, and we think of it more in athletics, really tall, athletic, fit people that, that like to work out. And um, they're, it's very good mistletoe for skin and retroperitoneum, um, kidneys, etc. cetera. Um, and of course, the Fraxini, we use that a lot in our clinic because it, it is the ash tree. And the ash tree is the, the tree of, um, of, of sun back in Celtic mythology. Um, and we use it for any sort of met metastatic spread. Um, sarcoma and leukemia, we, we use it. Um, so very, very potent. It, and because of its potency, it's usually selected for putting into tumors. It's not the only possibility, but it's usually the first selection. Um, oak has a very thick skin. Um, and that thick skin and the groundedness of it and its relationship to calcium uh, is something that we place an emphasis on. And when we want these structuring um, process uh, happenings, especially when uh, the patient has a lot of vulnerability and needs, needs a bit of, um, of strengthening in this skin region. Um, we use it in, in uh, uh, a lot of the GI tumors a lot of the time as well. Uh, the elm tree, I wanted to mention this last because Iskador is the only one making an elm mistletoe. Um, and you can see there's this weird imbalance in the leaf where it joins here. It's always asymmetric. And you think of elm, it's this tree of mercury, actually. Um, and it relates to the airy element, to the lungs. Um, it has these air bladders that form around the seed. Um, so often we think of it in lung cancer. We think of it when somebody maybe doesn't have a good work-life balance or, or if they have addictions, etc. cetera. Um, it's a very good mistletoe. Can really, if things are sort of stuck, the elm mistletoe can get things rolling again, get them moving. Um, here's some actual research from mistletoe. This is Iskador, and the green is the Iskador group, and this is uh, compared with a control group that's gray. So the green group took mis the mistletoe plus the chemo, the gray group only got the chemo, and quality of life went down in the control, and whoa, up quite a bit in Iskador. Functioning up, down. Uh, this is emotional functioning, cognitive functioning, uh, social functioning, and then you have physical symptoms of appetite loss. There's actually a gain. Uh, better sleep, better, less fatigue, less pain, less nausea. Um, there was still some diarrhea, constipation, but less than the control group in the, in the Iskador group. Um, this is a randomized controlled trial uh, with 65 breast cancer patients um, total. And they did applications of Viscador Mali, uh, I, IV, before chemotherapy. And the chemotherapy side effects were significantly lower here. Um, so quite, quite, uh, quite a strong effect, protective effect. Um, there's an immune protection. Many of my patients know that, gosh, I'm a little wary of surgery. Well, for good reason. Surgery, I, I, I always compare to organized trauma. Your body reacts to it just as if you had been run over by a car, um, which means that your risk of blood clots go up, your immune system tanks. Um, and we can counter those effects, because I'm a fan of surgery if it can cure cancer or help someone significantly. We just need to be doing the right things and the best things together. Um, not just saying, no, that doesn't happen. Well, if you look at it, Mr. Surgeon, it does happen, unfortunately. Um, I'm glad they do what they do because they're very skilled. Um, some of my patients have been operated on by some of the most skilled surgeons in the country, and I'm glad for it. But I want them protected. Um, 
intravenous mistletoe, we, we have a rationale here. We can rapidly escalate the dose if we need to. We get a higher maximum than sub-Q. There's a cancer-killing synergy. There's enhanced quality of life and immune protection. Um, this is interesting. We'll just go through both of these, but they're just two studies that were done. One was a nursing floor, another was a doctor-patient relationship. There were two studies on empathy, and they both found that not only does, do you feel bad if you get interacted with coldly by uh, a doctor that sort of scorns you and throws you out of the office or just doesn't want to say much to you, or, just, um, or, or a nursing floor that isn't warm, um, that's, that does the minimum. And, but they, they tested your natural killer cell function of those patients, compared them to the controls, and lo and behold, of course, their natural killer cell function in the non-empathetic fell, and the empathetic was preserved. So it's clear that there's a uh, effect emotively on the immune system, um, which is so important. This is one of the, the biggest meta-analyses that have been done. So meta-analysis is just basically saying, what are all the trials that have been done on mistletoe that we can conglomerate and compare and harvest all those statistics all together? Um, and what can we say about it? And so this line here is zero benefit, the, the one that goes all the way up. And this is survival benefit, and you want it to be out this way. Um, so it basically says, looking at 13,000, almost 14,000 patients, there was about a 40, almost a 41% um, less chance of death, better um, survival. 0.59 um, hazard ratio means that there's a about 40% chance of improved survival with mistletoe in this group of patients and pretty good p-value. Um, this is a recent trial on stage four non-small cell lung cancer. Um, and um, you can see a more than doubling of survival time compared to control um, here. And of course, we wanna have outliers. We don't wanna just end at 17 months, but um, this is pretty significant in the scientific world. Um, this is a uh, quality of life study that showed positive quality of life, which I think is pretty clear uh, from the others. This is a phase one trial that um, got finished at Johns Hopkins. Yay, Hopkins, thank you very much. Actually, we should thank Believe Big even more, the nonprofit that funded it. Um, which is not how most trials get funded. They usually get funded by big buck pharmaceuticals. So thank you, Believe Big, or Big Buck Heart Warmth has gotten a trial done. Um, and these were the successes. The, it was Helix or Mali um, given to 21 patients. And it, this is actually the first time a phase one was done in heavily pretreated patients. This means patients that are stage four and have gone through multiple lines of chemo, very resistant tumors, very hard to reach immune system, actually. And they had improvement in quality of life and in a few cases of unanticipated tumor response, improved survival. Um, this phase ones are really mainly just safety trials, but um, and of course, it's success when they say mistletoe is found to be safe. Um, this is an exciting new trial being recruited for at MD Anderson. Um, but the cool thing is it's a repeat of an osteosarcoma trial done in mostly young adults and, and older children who tend to get osteosarcoma. Um, the, the prior trial was a bit too small, but um, but it did show there was a, a recent update a few years back, um, and it, it showed uh, what they were testing was a chemo, an oral chemo pill called a topazide that was taken by one arm, and the other arm 
just mistletoe. This was prophylactic after they'd had uh, lung resection of the cancer, because this cancer goes to the lung very often. And what they found was, unfortunately, the atopazide arm had very poor survival, um, about seven month average. They all, all ended up dying um, of a recurrence. And in the Iskador arm, they still, they, they haven't actually been able to really calculate survival because the, there's still people alive in that arm. Many of them are still alive. Um, so huge, I, I'm actually really hugely impressed that MD Anderson chose this trial to put on US soil, so to speak. Um, but it's happening. Um, this is a safety trial. Uh, and we sort of give the figure about 5% of hypersensitivity, which is usually um, uh, about right. So 4.6% adverse drug reaction. And hypersensitivity usually is just itching and flushing. Um, usually not serious with, with IV. With sub-Q, you hardly see any hypersensitivity or any big reaction problems. Um, here's some to upper tolerated dose. They use something about the, um, almost three times our upper maximum, and they found that it was pretty safe, basically no, no major side effects, certainly not like chemo. Um, this is a case uh, of, a, of a dear patient of mine with stage four colon cancer. She is an author, uh, lives in Florida, and she found us when, we, when I was basically doing mistletoe infusions out of our living room uh, somehow. This is really the fine little spiritual threads that are so strong that tie people together. Because it's just a beautiful story. Her, she was very sick in the hospital, and her sister was very devout and was praying in a restaurant. And after her prayer, she got up and paid and left. And the first thing she saw was a big mistletoe plant in a tree. And she said, okay, God, I'll listen. And she went home and got on Dr. Google and found that indeed mistletoe might be useful in cancer. And then she said, how do I find a place where my sister could, find, could get this? And somehow we, we only were on one little tiny directory at that point in time. Uh, this was a while back, and her sister found it, and then we got a call, and we saw, we saw um, the patient, and she had quite a lot of cancer, unfortunately. She had been on chemotherapy, and it had really not worked so far. One scan to the other, there was no change. Um, same amount of disease, despite chemotherapy. And it, she was worried about that, of course, um, and aside from the anemia, and she had some pain in her pelvic region, um, she was actually pretty strong. Um, and we decided to do IV Helixor. Um, I did the pine mistletoe for her, and after the first infusion, she had a, a slight feeling, it wasn't pain, but she had a feeling of fullness right around here, we knew she had extensive liver metastases, um, but her vitals were fine. It wasn't painful. We let her go home after a while. Um, uh, and that, that actually got better um, and continued happening over several IVs. And this was um, seven infusions that we did, and she did sub-Q dosing and got good response to the sub-Q. And she continued the chemo. Um, this was her PET scan prior. People who know PET scans, so that's the brain. The brain typically likes sugar, and PET is, uh, FDG is a radioactive fluoride that's bound to um, dextrose or sugar. And we can watch where that sugar goes. So there's one normal place for it, and this is sort of a normal place here. There's the kidneys and bladder. This is not normal, that's all cancer. Um, that's her liver, basically, it's all cancer. Very extensive liver metastases. And here you can actually see her liver. These are kidneys, that's normal. Um, this is the post, and this is 
also the um, the contrast in her kidneys and uh, ureters. So those are nor that's what you expect how your body's getting rid of that yucky stuff. Um, so you can see just a, this remarkable almost full response, like she almost had a full response in a, only a few months. Um, and the only difference was she had chemo. She had mistletoe with the chemo. Um, and next we'll talk a little bit about fever and warmth. And this slide is busy, we won't go through it all, but basically back in, in 500 BC, Parmenides said, give me the power to produce fever and I can cure all diseases. Um, and we saw this association between warmth and anti-cancer effect over and over and over again. Um, in just recently, we've gotten more into the science of it, that heat shock proteins are important, that the, it makes visible to the immune system that here's the problem, um, and that there's a synergistic effect there. From the anthroposophic viewpoint, you're pulling the eye forces into the body in a, in a, in a sense, you're allowing renovation to happen. Um, I like to look at childhood fevers and tell the parents, well, this is a renovation process. Your, your job isn't to raise a less wrinkled version of yourself and your husband or wife. Your job is to raise a free human being and that that eye force wants to recreate the, the hereditary body in its own way. And fever is a way to do that. Um, and cancer is also this transformative event that can happen. Um, we call it MFIT, which is mistletoe fever induction therapy. And you can use a high dose of ash tree mistletoe, which is Braxini, to create a reliable fever. Um, it's safe without any organ toxicity. You do get some side effects because it's a fever, but it's pretty well tolerated. Um, you can get it for about three, two to three days and for up to 101 to 104, occasionally a little higher. Um, this is a study that was done in pancreatic cancer where the doctors, this is in these big hospitals in Europe, they went in with an endoscope and injected the pancreatic tumor right there um, with, through the scope. Um, and the, they actually lengthen the survival very considerably um, of unresectable pancreatic cancer. This is a patient of mine near and dear um, to me, and she had a... a unfortunately was diagnosed with a triple negative breast cancer um, with stage two. This was many years ago now. Um, she went to uh, do a lumpectomy and then dendritic cell therapy in Mexico and then did some IVC. Unfortunately, she had recurrence in the same breast um, and then presented to us several years ago now. Can't believe it's been so long. Uh, she had a large, uh, large tumor in that breast by palpation. Um, sorry, the slide's not fitting all the way on. But um, she did do PET CT at my urging. I can, we talked about that. And the PET CT showed that tumor to have a central area of necrosis. Um, it showed some involved axillary nodes, um, mediastinal nodes. Um, you would you would stage this as a stage 3C triple negative breast cancer. And even with the most potent chemotherapy, surgery, radiation, immunotherapy, that, that's a difficult diagnosis to have. Um, and this patient was wonderful and very deeply rooted in herself. She and still is and knew herself quite well. And she said, I don't care what you say to me, and it, it, I don't want to do chemotherapy or radiation. And at, at the time, she didn't want to do surgery either. She said, those are really not things in my worldview. I, I don't think they are things I want in my body at all. Um, and I said, wow, OK. Well, I want to give you the, the I don't want to abandon you. I want to give you the strongest thing that I can do. 
and let's let's me put it on the table and this is what we did and she said let's do it um, she had the courage to go forward and the the first the first fever she had so what we did was this mistletoe fever induction we put mistletoe IV um, 60 milligrams it's a quite a big dose to, for reference, 0.2 milligrams of this mistletoe will give you a skin reaction um, if you're mistletoe naive. Um, 10 milligrams into the tumor, and she got a, a fever that was recorded of 100.9, but probably quite a bit higher because she went into this lucid dream that she actually, not everyone does this, but she actually had a lucid dream where she was turning into a mistletoe plant. Um, <laughs> but more importantly, um, she worked through old traumas that she had had since childhood. Um, and that's actually something that is runs like a thread through mistletoe fever therapy, that, that these old things that are stuck get unstuck, uh, or can, it's not that they just do, that they can. They can get re, they can get pulled to the surface and transformed. Um, she had, uh, of course, very uniquely. If, if you look at the whole case, um, not everyone gets really high fevers all the time, um, and we kept it this um, sub Q dose and kept injecting more and more mistletoe into this centrally necrotic area of the breast, which was very useful because it, it um, I think it, it was less painful to inject that there because it was already, necrotic tissue was already sort of fluid. Um, so we could just put the needle in and put the mistletoe there and it acted as a reservoir. Um, you can see she had kept having robust fevers and even more and more and more and more. And then at day 77, this is a long while through, we had talked a bit and, uh, and she opened her mind a bit to saying, well, if I could get a lumpectomy, it would be worthwhile, make some sense. And at the time there was a surgeon using a, a very high, um, highly developed laser technique that otherwise is only done in Europe. Um, and, but he said, okay, well, I won't do it now. You need to wait a little bit because the tumor's inflamed right now. We're, you've done all this mistletoe. I don't know mistletoe. He's a pretty out-of-the-box guy, but uh, conventional, really. And so we waited. And as we waited, this tumor shrank and shrank. Um, down from 11 centimeters, because we made it grow, immune infiltration will make the tumor get a little bigger. Um, it went to the size of, of a walnut. We verified that with an ultrasound four centimeter to four centimeter, and it was around 11 centimeters here. Um, so we were both ecstatic. Um, yeah, this, this lovely patient drove, I think round trips, many hours just to say, you need to physically see this portion of my anatomy that has responded to therapy in this way. This is amazing, and we were really overjoyed. We knew that we'd have a good response. Um, and at almost day 100, she had lumpectomy, went well. Um, and the, the pathology report showed a well circumscribed cavity with necrotic center. At that point, it was 2.8 by 2.2, so it shrunk even more. Um, the breast tissue had an abscess cavity, abundant necrosis, numerous histiocytes, dense fibrosis, fibroblast proliferation, it mixed with recent and old blood. Remaining breast tissue shows fibrocystic changes. No evidence of malignancy. So this whole tumor went dead um, through these, this treatment. And I repeat to people that this is not the, always the typical result. This is what Rudolf Steiner meant 100 plus years ago when he envision that maybe at some day mistletoe could replace the scalpel um, because actually she didn't need the surgery really and and the, the most important thing that i think in this whole thing is 
that we have to add in is that through the whole process, she was working with uh, some of Joe Dispenza's techniques um, and exercises. She was journaling and in her journal pages, and she showed me, she's not a, a scientist or a doctor, but her journaling showed exactly this, exactly her pathology result. And she would meditate on her journal and to the point where she would cry multiple times a day, and she knew she was already healed, and she was confident in that. And I think that has a lot to do with her transformation and healing, because it was really not just on the outside. I mean, sure, we did a lot of technical things, but it was on the inside. And I could say in a very sweet way that when we first met, she was anxious, not just because she had cancer. I don't think that actually made her that anxious, but she just responded to things with some anxiety. And now she's like a, really has, is like a rock. I mean, she is really unflappable. Um, and, and anywhere she goes exudes this calmness. And I think that's beautiful. And that's what real healing is all about, is an inner transformation. Um, so this is sort of the cleanup phase, uh, we could call. Um, you can see she still was getting some temperatures even afterwards, which I'm very impressed that, that not everyone is so fever ready even after all this mistletoe. Um, now she's at, at three plus years after triple negative. If you have no active disease, you can really can say the risk of recurrence is almost nil. It really is gonna happen in the first two years um, with triple negative. That's a, not like other breast cancers. Hormone driven has a long, very narrow chance, but a long window where it could recur on they're, they all have a different behavior. Um, and the interesting thing on scans, ultrasounds, and I'm only sharing this because the patient is allowing me to share all this. She signed, says, look, get it out there. Um, but she had still had those lymph nodes for a couple of years. Um, we didn't know if they had cancer. You couldn't even take one of them out. It was like deep in the chest. They, dis they actually self-resolved. So we had likely a abscopal effect. Um, and I can say this is a very exciting, very exciting case. So we wrote it up, so we put it in a journal. Um, and my friend Vinay and I put, uh, put together this article, put it in a, a peer-reviewed journal. Um, but really, I'm just here for the mistletoe. <laughs> and, uh, I'll end there. On a very nice note, and um, this is sort of our clinic, prettied up for pictures. And our tiny houses outside, and that's not inside the tiny house, of course. Um, and here's the mistletoe book. Um, if you haven't seen it, I'm honored to be part of one of the little authors on it. You work with all of these folks; they're just amazing. Um, Peter Hindenburger, of course, is. Sort of the, the grandfather of mistletoe in this country. He's the giant whose shoulders we're standing on. Um, he was doing it when nobody knew what mistletoe was. Uh, I think he was training when I was born. Um, and he's still working. I, I have to say I have deep, deep respect for all of them. So now, and now you just gave an example of a patient who had only surgery after mistletoe. So she started with mistletoe, she had no of this, no standard things. She just got the mistletoe and then she got the lumpectomy. Mm -hmm. What are, are there any statistics or trials of people who did, who have, I don't know what stage, mm -hmm. say stage two cancer, that do only mistletoe? Yeah, good question. So the, the question is, because I think there's a microphone issue here, but we'll solve that next month. Um, the question has been in, 
in the very beginning of the slides, we had some statistics of all the conventional stuff and um, radiation, chemo, surgery, immunotherapy, hormone therapy, um, and then mistletoe added to it. And the question was, this was in a very, very impressive case, and are there, what about people who say, I don't want to do all of these conventional therapies? Are there statistics, are there studies looking at just mistletoe in cancer? Um, the closest one, the, the answer is there's not a lot of studies with only mistletoe in cancer. It's usually used adjunctively, and these cases are, are people who are very courageous because we, I don't know the response. She didn't know what the response would be. We walked into it with very open eyes before, with that. We had very, very heartfelt discussions about it. Um, I'm overjoyed with that result. I can tell you I wish that I knew the magic sauce or the whatever to make that happen every time. And um, it's something that we're all working for. The closest thing that is in my study is this is the um, the yeah here. So this was unresectable pancreatic cancer, and these were people, and it unfortunately was not compared to control, um, but they were people just treated with mistletoe, um, and you could see that it. But if you did compare that to a arm of um, people that were given standard of care, you would see, in the study actually did compare that and said this is actually favorable st survival statistics for this very difficult to treat disease, pancreatic cancer. Um, that's, that's one. The other is the, the MD Anderson trial. Now that's prophylactic, right? Um, and it could be people who have never had chemotherapy. Um, and one arm was given chemo and the other arm just mistletoe. That's not that normal even in Europe to, to see st studies where only mistletoe is used. Um, but to be honest, they knew that the atopazide arm wasn't going to do well to begin with. Like the, the survival of that isn't very good, unfortunately. It just doesn't work. Um, so, and they said, well, let's, let's try something else. And they, they, that's how it passed the IRB board, uh, the review boards, um, the ethical report, review boards for the studies. And they were people whose lives were saved because they were, they were in the mistletoe arm. Of course, not all of them. That's, so what is that? I, I wish it were. Um, we, are, we often wish we had the magic wand for, for everybody, but in, I know I have something that can help people, um, and that's hard. And I, I wish there was also not just a magic wand, but a way to, to even put mistletoe in that category of, um, of what works and how much does it work. We probably need several more million dollars to ascertain a, a um, a, to put it in the predict tool, basically, to put a curve there. And it's the best I can do. Mark, we have a question from online. Um, one, do you have patients on immunotherapy, nivolumab, and mistletoe simultaneously? And two, does mistletoe penetrate the blood-brain barrier from metastases to the brain? So, good questions. Um, the, we do have patients on uh, the, the checkpoint inhibitors, um, of which there's uh, now a bigger handful than there was originally. <coughs> as, you might, as you might expect, the checkpoint inhibitors are, uh, just to explain for people who don't know what those are, we, we have therapies that are called immunotherapy, that aren't really immunotherapy, they're, they're like antibodies that either are payloaded with chemo and hook on somewhere and are heat sinking chemo or they're blocking something. 
And we have what I call true immunotherapy, which are the checkpoint inhibitors. The, the true immunotherapy you have to be careful with. They can be really big um, integral tools, but they can also give big side effects. Um, and, and, you know, the whole, very commonly the thyroid um, can be wiped out. It can be Hashimoto's, just like between one treatment and another, um, or worse. I mean, it's a it's a scary proposition, and when you're weighing what what should I do and and what's possible with as a side effect, there, there there's not one right way to decide. Um, the, I actually took out some of the safety trials to shorten this presentation. There are safety trials on the checkpoint inhibitors with mistletoe. Um, the and there's also safety trials on mistletoe with the, the other antibody therapies, the targeted therapies, from Avastin to Herceptin um, to any of the other targeted therapies where the antibodies are targeting. Um, they're both shown to be safe. Actually, it's, it's five times safer in the antibody therapies. Um, we still tread with caution in the checkpoint inhibitors, because the checkpoint inhibitors basically are saying, hey, your immune system has the capacity, some of the immune system, most of it may be blind, some of it may be a little allergic, but some of it is actually killing the cancer. It's finding it and killing it. And so what if we take the brakes off the immune system and let that go, let that cancer get killed even way more? And we figured out ways to do that with these checkpoint inhibitors. We're basically cutting the brake line of the, of the immune system. And that's why whole organs can be wiped out by your immune system while you're on this. But it's also why you can have a very amazing and robust response to the immunotherapies. <coughs> and of course, the mistletoe, it's not, an, uh, it's not what I would call an immune upregulator only. It's really an immune modulator. So people have asked me, can you use mistletoe if you have autoimmunity? Yes, you can. You can safely. And it's been studied in trials. And you can use it, though cautiously. You, you really want someone who has, has some skill level working with mistletoe if you're using it with checkpoint inhibitors naturally. Because if you're taking the brakes off the immune system and you're saying, we want a little more T cells and natural killers, then you, you don't want to go too strongly. Like I, I would not do mistletoe fever induction therapy with the checkpoint inhibitors going. I, I'm not confident enough to do that yet um, because I don't know the outcome. Um, it might be just fine. It might be the thing we've all been looking for, but I, I don't know that I would do that together. But I have done everything as, as much as IV Fraxini, which is very, very high lectins with the checkpoint inhibitors, and it helps. Um, the, it, it helps the outcome, it helps the tolerability. The question about the blood-brain barrier is a good one. There, the, um, it, it's quite clear that from studies that mistletoe compounds do cross the blood-brain barrier and your immune cells actually actively will cross the blood-brain barrier as well. Um, there's, in, in some of the, the patients I have with brain tumor, we talk about specifically injecting a venous, an area around a venous plexus around the back of the head. Good, well, thank you all for coming. It has been really a pleasure to talk about mistletoe and anthroposophic medicine and oncology in a, hopefully a new way and a, hopefully a meaningful way. Um, thank you for all of the people on the live stream that have joined us too. Lots of love. Thanks so much. Thank yes. you.